Massachusetts, yeah. There's... Aha. Okay, got it. So that's happening. Yeah. That's Do happening. I need to lose the, the pictures of people? To, so I think I'd rather... Is that too small, then, the Evolution Films, the PowerPoint? That isn't too small. If you keep it like that, we had it like this for our first workshop, so that's fine. I'm going to turn my camera off in a minute, and I'm going to advise others to, so it's just you, and then we can okay, just see... Right. You can just see you talking next to the slide, so that would be good. Brilliant. Okie dokie. So I'll let a few more people in. Good. More people. Excellent. Up to 16 now. Great. Well, well done, everybody. Uh, good morning. Should we get, should we start? Okay, let's start. So I'll just introduce what we're doing today. Thanks for coming, everybody. Yeah. Thanks for your time on this wonderful July morning. Thanks particularly to Terry for giving us his precious time. I'll introduce Terry in a minute. Let me just introduce the project. So you're part of this meeting. You're now part of Evolution Film. So feel free to put this on your CV when you're applying for jobs within the creative industries. You're part of this community now. So this is our second event. This is a British Academy project. I'm Jason Lee. I'm Professor of Film at the Montford University. And I'm also a British Academy Innovation Fellow. And with my co-partner, Terry Bamba and his company, Jones Bamba Productions. We're working on a number of different projects, and this is one of them. And Raina Lautzitz has also kindly put together today's event. And so we developed this organization, Evolution Film. So thanks for being part of this. And can I advise you then, if you want to turn your cameras off, that would be good for the bandwidth, okay, when I stop talking and it's being recorded. And this recording will appear on our website and we'll give you more details about the website at the end. We'd also like to take a photograph, if that's okay, a screenshot of everyone within the meeting. There's 20 people in this meeting now. So at the end of the meeting, Raina will take that photograph and that will also appear on our website. So thanks for that. So thanks for taking part. So Terry's gonna talk for about 45 minutes or longer, up to Terry completely. And then we'll have questions at the end. So yep. if you the questions at the end, that would be great. I think that's about it as an intro to do with Evolution Film and this British Academy project with Jones Bamber Productions and De Montford University. Let me introduce Terry Bamber. Terry Bamber is a legend and <laughs> he's been working in the British film industry and Hollywood and Bollywood all over the world for the last 50 years. He's been involved in amazing films, low budget films, mega budget films. He's working on Fast and the Furious. Is it nine or 10? It's 10. 10. 10. Okay, 10 at the moment. So you can see the scale of what Terry's been working on. And he's going to talk to you today about his career and diversity within the film industry. Thank you very much, Terry Bamba. Nice. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, please feel free, if I waffle on too much, to go make a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and then come back, because I'm hoping that we're going to keep going for about an hour and a half. Um, the reason that I, I joined up with this with Jason is that uh, when people say to me, how did I get into the film industry, uh, I had it very, very easy. I my father was in the film industry. My two uncles were in the film industry. And right from the early age, I was taken to film sets and taken on locations. Um, and very briefly, uh, the, the key moments that made me realize I wanted to go into film and television was dad had taken me and my sister to see the volcano set of You Only Live Twice, which was quite a mind blowing, just unbelievable experience for a nine year old. Um, and just the sheer scale of it and the number of people involved. And what I didn't realize then that I realize now is how many people there are that go into making television or film productions. And that every single individual that works on these programs counts. And I've called, I've called my PowerPoint uh, presentation, Everyone Counts, because they do. Um, and and it's, it's too, sometimes it's a glib thing to say, uh, but a, a, a story came to mind when I was working with a director uh, who was a temperamental so-and-so, bless him, and sometimes 
uh, he, he would not express what he wanted. But this particular day, he overslept. We were in a, a very tight schedule. It was a medium, medium sized budget. And luckily the DOP had, had spoken extensively to the director about what he wanted with this scene. And the actors agreed that they would start shooting that scene without the director. So we were able to keep going and keep filming. On another production, the wardrobe bus driver overslept. We had everybody else there, but because we never had access to the wardrobe bus, we couldn't get the costumes out and we couldn't start filming. So that just goes to show that whether you're a director or the wardrobe bus driver, and one last story on this about why I want to make sure that everybody realizes that everybody is important. Uh, yesterday, we were on a recce for the film we're doing now, and we went past Waterloo Station. And that reminded me uh, of a time when we were filming 102 Dalmatians. And we had a scene to film where uh, the heroine was riding around on a scooter with one dog on the back behind her and four dogs running alongside her. And we wanted to tie the scene with a train going across the bridge at the top and going, and then, then we would um, crane down to reveal them coming through. Well, there were about nine roads that I had to control to lock off before I could give the go ahead for safety for, for everybody, for the animals, for the, for the, the stunt double on the motorbike. And um, so the only way to do that was having the lock offs everywhere. And before I gave turnover to the cameras, getting a, a lock off note from everybody. So on the first take, I got to lock off seven, lock off seven come in, no answer. Lock off seven, lock off seven, everything okay. So I then had to hold everything. I had to get a security guard to run to lock off seven. And unfortunately lock off seven was being attacked by some thugs outside the pub in the area that he was locking off. And he was having a little bit of confrontation there. So I had to start again. The second time we went to go for it, got to uh, nine, lock off nine and lock off nine never answered. Now lock off nine never answered because his battery had gone dead because it had taken us so long to set up on, the, on this particular location. But the point of this is the PA, whose job it is to make sure that all the ADs have got proper radio charged batteries, they are important. Every little part goes into making a film what it is when, when you see it. And why film and television? Why would why would somebody want to work in film and television? Um, I've, I'll let some of I'll talk to some folks later. But uh, our lovely standby art director working with us at the moment, uh, she didn't want. She started actually wanted to be a fashion designer and then wanted to go into window dressing. And then she bumped into a, a colleague of mine who, who's worked in the art department and suggested that she tried an art department course at uh, Pinewood Studios, which Terry Ackland Snow runs. Um, and he run, runs a very, very good uh, course in art department work. Um, so you can go that route of going to film school, of getting university degrees, but so much of it is word of mouth and being in the right place at the right time and, and, and meeting that person will give you a chance. Um, when I started, uh, it was as a background artist. Uh, Dad was uh, was doing a film uh, directed by Brian Forbes and they needed some football supporters watching Malcolm McDowell uh, score the winning goal in this particular game. So that was about 1969. And then from then on, Dad would always get me as a, an additional floor runner uh, during my school holidays. But the second most important thing that happened to me when I used to go to the studios with, with him, there was a wonderful film, which probably a lot of you, because you're so young, haven't heard of. But if you ever get a chance to see it, it's a film called The Whisperers. Um, and it was a film directed by Brian Forbes and written by Brian Forbes. And this will come back to why writing is so important in what we're doing and, and why I'm so keen with Jason on this to develop people and opportunities with writing. Um, it's a story about a lonely lady, a lonely uh, old age pensioner who lives alone and she hears voices, she hears voices. And this particular day I was invited to the set and I remember standing watching the, the filming and it was Dame Edith Evers was all she was doing was making a cup of tea and shuffling around the kitchen. There was no stunts, no spec, nobody else in her. And I could not take my eyes off her. Her performance was just mesmerizing. And I, it was just at that point, I wanted to become an actor. Um, and so 
love of films and love of acting started through obviously my introduction through my family and it's not to say that nepotism is a bad thing because if you look through all history so in the old days when the mining industry was was right a miner's son would follow his father into the mines and i think I've been so lucky with that that I want to try and give something back to the industry and try and help people wherever I can. And that's people with all different abilities um, and all different attributes they can bring, bring to the industry. Um, I wanted to, to act so much, so I, I ended up joining a, a junior uh, stage school run by a BBC director in my early teens. And people kept saying, oh, yeah, you're quite good. You know, you ought to try, try and pursue a career as, as an actor. But my father kept whittling away at me and kept giving me jobs as a runner. But eventually I ended up uh, uh, studying at Lambda, which in those days uh, was, well, it's, it is the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Art. But when I was there, it was the London Academy of Manic Depressive Actors because we were always very angst ridden and very down and we've got to make change the world. And we've got to really do something important with our lives. Uh, but the, the sad truth was, or is, that I'm not a very good actor. Um, and I think my father realized that, so kept engineering me to go back and working into films. And in those days, which is so great now, and we've got to be very careful, we don't let this happen now. Um, in those days, to, to, to progress in your career, you had to belong to the union. And that in those days, it was the ACTT. And you had to do a certain number of films. You would have to be nominated by four different people to, uh, before your, your application would go before the union. And in fact, I got turned down three times by the union before I finally got accepted. But now with the advent of, of all the wonderful avenues open to us, we've got to guard against getting back to a closed shop situation. Um, I belong to the assistant directors union um, and they're trying to introduce a thing where you have to, if, if you come in as a floor runner, you have to do a certain number of days as a floor runner before you can maybe become a set PA and then another number of days before you can qualify to work as a third assistant. And I, I don't want us to go that way. Um, it's the same, I know the BFI have got some wonderful skill sets programs where on bigger films, they will uh, find one position uh, per department for a trainee to go to. Again, although that's great, I, I don't like that. I like the idea that we open it up to everybody. So you always give somebody a chance to come in from anywhere to do work experience. And with the work experience, there are things that I would say to people that if you're offered work experience and you're having a great time and somebody says, oh, you should stay and do another week, don't. Only ever do five days work experience unpaid. Because if, that, if somebody says to you, oh, this is great experience, but you're doing a great job, carry on doing it. If they need you, then you're doing a job that should be paid. So my, I, I love offering work experience, but I will always try to only keep it to five days and then find another way of helping people to, to get into a, a job situation. It may be that what you start out thinking you want to do, you won't do that. A lovely runner uh, came to work with me because, again, uh, through a, a friend, he was, he was the son of a friend uh, who was a, another producer. He hated being a runner, and I think he particularly hated me. Um, so much so, um, because when, when you're in the office, sometimes you, you're too busy, and one of the horrible jobs that a runner has to do is to make tea and coffees and get breakfast and everything. And this young lad sort of sauntered into the office and sort of mooched about, what can I do? And I said, well, I'd love to have a cup of coffee, and could I have a sausage sandwich, please? Because I love sausage sandwiches. Uh, but being a production manager, I know that the caterers trying to save money will only put butter on one side of the bread, then put the sausage in and then put the other side of the bread on top of that without any butter on it. So I said to, to, to young Charlie, I said, Charlie, I want a sausage sandwich, please. But make sure the sandwich is buttered both sides. And this goes comes on later when we talk about communication. So Charlie sauntered off. I, he, was, he was gone so long, it was nearly lunchtime by the time he came back. And I was working on a budget. I had three computers open, the budget, the schedule, and my notebook. And he came and he gave it to me in a little yellow um, thing like you get from McDonald's. So I opened that, went to take the sandwich, and the sandwich completely slipped out of my hand and landed butter side down on the computer. And he had buttered the outside of the bread. And I, he said, but you said you wanted buttered both sides. 
So it's he then realised he didn't want to work in production or in the AD department, and is now uh, because he had started me on that. The costume department were looking for somebody a runner to go and join them and work with them. So um, he went and joined and see, saw how he got. He's now one of the most successful wardrobe uh, supervisors in the industry. So your path could always go in different ways. You, you, don't, you don't always have to think, oh, yes, it's I want to do this for life. You There's there's so many other things like post-production, visual effects, uh, model work, special effects uh, work. Um, when I offered uh, work experience with people, obviously it tends to be within the production or within the AD department. Um, and then we'll go on to what, when you come to meet people, what you should do when you're, when you're trying to present yourself. I mean, I must be honest, um, I only ever really use people's CVs to check their names, to check if, if they know anybody or anybody that I've worked with, um, and to read a little bit about where they were born and that kind of thing. I then say, okay, yep, let's meet up. It's how you are when you meet people. It's how you are, how you present yourself. Um, and again, that's an intangible thing. You may get on brilliantly with an assistant director, but not necessarily with me and vice versa. You may come and meet me and think, oh, I'm not quite sure I want to work with him. So you have to remember when I know you, when youngsters start up, they're desperate to, for experience, desperate to meet people. But the board is very much in your your with you as well. You may be, go and meet somebody and you think, oh, maybe I, I don't want to work for that person. You mustn't feel that you have to accept everything that somebody offers you. You still got that right to make up your mind. No, I'm going to try and see if I can meet somebody else and see what happens there. I know it's terribly frustrating that you can send email after email and not get a, a reply. Um, and obviously, when I was younger, I used to it used to be stamped addressed envelopes that you sent out, and hardly any of those ever came back. But you only have, you need just that one moment, that one moment that you meet the person, the timing is right, and you kick off. And and what I try to do as well when we meet people is try to get in a situation where we can go and maybe meet for a pizza or go and watch a film together and introduce them to other third assistants, other assistant directors that we know. So you're building a widening the contacts that you've got. And the more, obviously, the more contacts you've got, the more chance you've got of going from film to film. Um, I just want to quickly tell you a couple of stories uh, about how people have got the tenacity not to give up. There was a young lad um, who ended up coming to Pinewood Studios. He'd been sending emails out to everybody, been trying to get work um, and hadn't been, hadn't, hadn't been very successful for up to a year, I think. He was working in other jobs. And then he got the idea that if he came to Pinewood Studios and worked in the canteen at Pinewood or the coffee shop as it was, he could offer his CV to people that came in to buy coffees and try and make contacts that way. And it was through that, which is how I met him, um, and he, he he gave me his CV. We looked at it. At that time, we were fully uh, staffed, so I couldn't offer him anything. But I had his name on file. And on that particular film, it was the first film that we'd shot digitally. So when we were away on location, everybody was very nervous about getting the backup hard drives back to England. So we said, well, I think we need to fly somebody out to Turkey, collect the hard drive and fly back with it. And this young man's name came up. Um, and he came in and he got the job for four weeks of traveling backwards and forwards between uh, Turkey and England, did a great job with that, was polite with everybody, was tenacious in being efficient. And um, uh, he got he later got offered another job on the following film. So it's it's use your initiative. I, I may a bit later when we when we start talking to other people, I may ask Michaela it was my second assistant in a moment to regale her with some of her stories of how she found work. Um, and I've got a little video a bit later uh, that uh, a colleague of ours now who ex is an ex-soldier, but is a very, very talented individual and how he's been uh, working with us recently. Um, why did I end up working as an assistant director um, and what qualities do you need as an assistant director? Um, 
I'm just going to scroll down now onto this, which is like, I think you can, obviously there's the paperwork. Obviously there is making sure that everything you're asked to do, you do efficiently. But why I've got this, everyone counts. Dignity, kindness, and diversity in films, television, and theater. I've included theater because um, it's all part of that, of encompassing everything that is creative. And all that relies on good writing, on writing that, that builds a character that draws you in. So that even if you're, if you're, uh, even if you're watching uh, an action movie, you've got characters that you really want to, you, you care about. And in fact, I'm not, everybody's got their own, own opinion of the films, but a, a, a big budget film that we've just seen. Yeah, I've got it. Is that you, Raina? Sorry, Terry, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Perfect. Somebody was waiting in the lobby. I just wanted to make sure that you let them in. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Yes, admit. Sorry about the distortion. Thank you. No, no sorry. No, that's good. Um, and the thing about the um, the dignity and kindness is that... Uh, how do I do it? Come out of that. Is... Um, in this day and age, it's very, very difficult. Have I got somebody's, can I hear somebody's um, microphone? Somebody, ah, ah, that might be better. It's in this day and age, um, sometimes um, you're working for someone who is under an enormous amount of pressure. And sometimes that will result in them shouting or losing their temper uh, or saying something that isn't directly aimed at you, but because you're fulfilling that position, either as the PA or as the AD, it will be aimed in your direction. Uh, and it's very difficult to understand that what you mustn't take that as a personal thing. It, we shouldn't do it. I mean, the other reason that I wanted to do this is to show that I'm not perfect. In the last, uh, well, last year, um, I've been accused of being a bully on four separate occasions. Um, and in fact, lost a job because somebody had felt that I had bullied them uh, when I was working as a production manager and they didn't want to work with me again. Um, and I think it's, it's only right that I admit to that when I'm talking about this, because we are all human, we are all fallible and we will all make mistakes and it's how we deal with the mistakes, learning from the mistakes and coming back and trying to, to improve oneself. The great thing now, of course, with film and television is people really are beginning to understand that we've all got issues. That I think I, I read a recent report that uh, uh, nearly 70 percent of film and television people encounter mental issues um, and that everybody has an issue that they have to deal with, even if it comes down to if you're worried about you have to write something and your spelling's not very good. Or if you're, if you're allergic to a, a certain kind of um, uh, hay fever, even hay fever, if you're, if you're trying to work and you know that if you, you could be sneezing and crying and, and, and your eyes weeping, but you're trying to do your job. I think there's much more understanding in the industry now. And I've, I've worked with so many lovely people. There's a, a, a script supervisor uh, who sadly was only born with one arm. Now, you, if you see a script supervisor, you see all the paperwork we've got to carry. She, she wears a prosthetic arm, and you, there's no way that you would realise that she's only got one arm. Um, other people, obviously, it's harder to see their issues. It's harder to see that they are come to work uh, and they're worried sick because they've got a parent at home who's not very well or they're coming to work and, and they've just lost somebody who's just died. Um, and you you don't know that. You're yelling at them to go and lock off that corner and make sure nobody comes around the corner. And then some, suddenly if somebody does come around that corner and they can't stop them, you're yelling, can you not do your job properly? Whereas you've got, I, I particularly have to learn that nobody makes a mistake on purpose. And that's why you've always got to try to be kind to the people you work with. There's a, 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 another way that I've said to people to get into the industry is to work as a background artist. 
to go on set because as a background artist, you get to see everything that's going on. You see the camera work, you see what the assistant directors do. Um, but sadly, it is there is a reputation that background artists aren't treated properly, that they're just treated like cattle or that they're herded around. They, they, they're, they're sort of, they have to wait before they can get that lunch. Luckily, that's being addressed. And people are, are realizing that even somebody with their back to camera passing behind the lead actor uh, in a particular scene can is as important as the Tom Cruise or the Brad Pitt or whoever in front of the camera. Um, in terms of, of working and, and trying to keep a whole balance of a team with male and female and all that, I all my life, my, my greatest mentors and my greatest teachers have been women, uh, wonderful producers, wonderful production managers, um, and I've, so I've never really seen that side of the industry where old women are being held back. And, but now it's, it's everywhere you go that you, 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 it has to, a, a team has to include everybody. And, that, and that's male, female, um, uh, whatever ethnicity you are. Um, I've, one of my favorite uh, uh, friends is, is a, a gentleman called Lincoln Abraham, who I first worked with. Uh, back in 1988, when they the, um, they first introduced uh, bringing uh, people in to to work as a trainees, and Lincoln got lumbered with me. He always wanted to work in the camera department, but he came, and I was location manager on this job. Um, and he he taught me uh, things because I I would never have dreamed we we were filming um, a film called Pirate Prince, and we were filming it down in Cardiff. And we, in those days, we'd never had all the, the extras agencies we have now. So we used to go to job centers and video people and interview people that way and get our background artists that way. Um, and Lincoln said, to me, There's a, where we're filming was a very rundown area of Cardiff. This was before the redevelopment. And he said, why don't we go to that job center? Because we might get people uh, that actually really do need the work that may be of the kind of for want of better words, would maybe dealing in criminal activities. And I th so I, I thought about it and we went down, we met the, the manageress there and she said that would be a brilliant idea to try and get them involved. Um, so we did, we went to this job centre um, and we needed pirate, black pirates, Indian pirates, all sorts of pirates. And the, the list of the things that they're done and the bad things that happened to them in their lives, we could talk about that for the rest of this morning. But they all signed up. They all signed up uh, and they did not miss one single day of filming. They made the film more believable. Um, and they proved to me, like, once again, that everyone counts, that everybody's got a story and everybody's got a story to tell. And Lincoln uh, made me realize that. And Lincoln now is one of the top uh, lighting directors in, in television. He does all the big award shows and things like that. Um, and he hasn't changed. He would always say a please and thank you. He would always treat everybody the same. Um, I, I think I'm trying to stress really a little bit from what I wanted to do. Um, I think I just want to go through because somebody said to me, are we doing the right thing in trying to offer work to people who may be, have I issues in life and difficulty in life um, by giving them the uh, say, well, yeah, come and work on a film, really get stressed really get worked up with how, you know, how long the day is and things going wrong and how do you get through that? Um, so I, I just put on this PowerPoint, which I, I think I'm, I want to try and share with everybody when we finish this, because there's some interesting uh, videos on there that, that would be worth looking at. But this is, this is my day now, um, which I, I'm 66 now, I've got a dodgy back, my knees are dodgy, um, and I try to stay fit because it, it, it is, you do need energy in, in the industry. So I try to walk five miles every day before I go to work. And I live in a beautiful part of the world where it's a beautiful commons and that. Um, and it helps set my mind uh, for the day. I think about things that we might be filming during the day. And I think, oh yeah, well, let's try and change that order around. Um, and then you drive to work, um, get up. And I, when I was a, a second assistant director, uh, the first assistant directors in those days would only ever turn up five minutes before the call time. 
So it was left to the assistant director's team, the second and the third and the PAs to get everything up and running. I, I like to be there from that first call so that I'm constantly talking to the team, finding out what issues, whether an actor is, is late, um, or whether there's something gone wrong in the makeup and, and, the, and the costume rooms getting ready. So I'm there with them so that we're, we are a team. It is, everybody is together. Um, as, as you see on here, uh, we try to do a 10 hour continuous day now, which is a long enough day. When I started, um, uh, my first job at Pinewood Studios was as a runner on the man with a golden gun. And in those days, it was an eight hour day. We started at 8.30 in the morning and we wrapped at 5.30 at night. If you wanted to do overtime, you had to go to the union and to the studios and discuss what they in those days was called call in the quarter. And you paid overtime right from the moment you went past the eight hours. And the funny thing is we made just as great films then as we do now, but without all those extra hours. Um, so a 10 hour continuous day for me is, is good. What, you've, what you might find now is that because of COVID, um, we were advised, a lot of productions were advised to definitely stop for half an hour um, so that everybody could queue, get their food and, and keep the social distancing. And some naughty productions have saw, seen this as a way, well, let's increase that, increase that to allow for that half hour break. We'll add another half hour. And I'm not quite sure how the union allowed that to happen, but there was a, a Netflix production we worked on last year, which I think is the same, that they do an 11 hour day um, and stop half an hour for lunch. Whereas on a continuous day, because the COVID said you had to stop half, I tried to keep it to 10 and a half hours. Uh, unfortunately, on some productions, they still stick to the old 12 hour day, which is uh, 11 hours on camera um, and an hour for lunch, which is good if you're prepping something or planning, but it just, it, you end up doing 14, 16 hours a day. Uh, so that's another thing that you have to think about when you come into the industry, because you do have to make sacrifices. You do have to say, okay, well then I'm not gonna see my friends during the week. Um, I'm not gonna be able to, um, to go to see, I, I support West Ham. I mean, the number of games I've missed for West Ham because it's a midweek game and we're never gonna wrap in time to get there. Um, and, and family life. Um, well, if, if you obviously, where we were talking yesterday about trying to create crashes at work, so that uh, uh, mothers can come back to work uh, uh, much earlier, continue their careers and, and bring their child to work. I mean, we did it on, on Carry On Columbus in, back in 1992 when we worked Saturdays, we had a crash all day for the, uh, the actors and the key crew to bring their children to work. And we had uh, um, a carer looking after them. So we can do it. We can make the, uh, our industry available to everybody whatever the circumstances. Um, the, the mental side of the industry is, is very difficult to, to, to understand if you're not aware that somebody's ill. And I know, again, we've got health, health, uh, health and safety officers. We've got various places on, on the set now that you can ring people, talk to people um, and address it that way. But also we've got to educate our crews uh, that we encompass everybody. Um, and if there was a lovely chap that I love working with, and sometimes he has a, a, a day where he's not well enough to get out of bed, but you don't em not employ him because of that. You make sure you've got a fallback plan that that day that you may need a certain number of PAs and assistant directors, and he's not available, then, then you call in an emergency replacement. But what he brings as an individual when he works is fantastic. He's, he's at energy and his drive and the way he treats people and his attention to detail, it, it would be madness not to work with him. Um, and I mean, I, 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 I'm talking personally now that the last three years has been, as we know, been difficult for everybody with COVID and, and Brexit and, and all sorts of things. And we've, and we've all known people that have been ill. We've, we've, we've lost friends that have been ill through it. And for me, um, two years ago, um, my wife divorced me. Um, and that, that really, really shook me up. Um, but I still was working. I was still at work. I still had to go to work. 
make sure that I did my job as an assistant director. And the support that I received from the productions I was working on and my team got me through those days when there were days when I, I or I didn't want to be on set. Um, but of course, the great thing, the cathartic side of being on set is you're such a part of a team that you those things go right to the back of your mind and you concentrate on the on the job that you're doing and, and, and making the film and the TV series. Um, the when you start the first day on your job, it's always make sure that you smile, smile at everyone and smile at people you don't even know. Uh, because you don't know what kind of day they're having. I, I would like to think that um, even on the bad days, we will at least have some laughs on our set. I've been so lucky to work with very kind people. And I've, I'm going to, a lot of people that know me will, will know this name and I'll, I'll mention it again now. There was a wonderful, wonderful director uh, called Mickey Moore. Uh, and if you get the chance to look him up on IMDb, uh, or if you go on Amazon, there's a wonderful book that he's written called My Magic Carpet Rider Films. Well, Mickey, when I first worked with him, was 83. Um, he had been a child actor as a baby. He played Baby Jesus to Mary Pickford in a silent movie. He was Cecil B. DeMille's prop man. He directed Elvis Presley in a movie in the 60s. He was a second unit director on the first three Indiana Jones films and was responsible for those wonderful action sequences. Um, and he he was, I don't think I ever, in the, the two and a half years that I worked with Mickey, I ever saw him lose his temper. I never saw him be anything other than kind uh, to people. And if, if somebody came on set that he didn't know that was starting today, he would ask who their name, ask them what they were doing, um, and thank them very much because their contribution to the film he valued. And one, again, a very quick story. Um, we were doing this sequence in 102 Dalmatians where all the animals uh, were supposed to have come together. Um, Cruella had, had been undergoing psychological treatment to make her love animals. So we had various animals that didn't like each other getting on with each other. And one of our animals was a goose and a fox. And we had to shoot the goose and the fox being quite nice to each other in a little cell. Um, well, the, the goose, is the most horrible animal I've ever met in my life. The fox was lovely, absolutely lovely. And we, we, we'd we set aside, I, I'd hoped we were gonna shoot it in an afternoon. Uh, after take 87, we still couldn't get it. And, and, and Mickey Blessing wanted to do it properly with the two animals together, not use visual effects and do it with a split screen and put one against green screen and, and then combine it in the post-production. So uh, towards the end of the day, we decided to go and shoot an insert on something. And Mickey said, well, let's come back tomorrow morning. Hopefully the, the animals will be fresher uh, and they'll be ready to do it. Um, so come the next morning, um, and this was like day 66 of the schedule, uh, Mickey and I were called for a meeting. But I said to, to my third, okay, we all know where the cameras are gonna go. I want everything set up. So when Mickey and I come back, we're all ready to go. So we went off to the meeting about an hour after call we came back came on the set everybody's drinking coffee talking chatting the cameras weren't set up and i rather impolitely said what the heck's going on here um, and told everybody off um, and we got the shot and at the end of the shot uh mickey said uh you know terry me boy I, I, I think you were a bit harsh on everybody with that you know we've been working really long hours we've been doing this for 66 days now I, I think we. I think you were wrong. And I said, Mickey, do you think I should say sorry to everybody? And he said, I think you should. I think you should. And so we we finished the next setup. I called everybody. And I said, look, everybody, I do apologize that I, I lost my temper with you all this morning. Um, I had hoped we were going to be totally ready, but Mickey felt that I should apologize. So please take this apology. And, and we had this lovely best boy called Stephen Roberts. Uh, and he, he shot his hand up near and said, no, sir, you were right, sir. We should have been ready. We would do anything for you, sir. And so what could have been a horribly embarrassing moment became something funny that we could all share in. And then we moved on from that. Um, so humor, smiling means so much, even when you go on your interview, because I, I, I hate interviews. So when um, we, Michaela and I always try to meet people that send their CVs to us, um, and we try and have a cup of coffee with them. 
so that they can feel relaxed and we could just have a general a general chat about everything um and normally we're in a position where we can say look we've, we've got a big day coming up soon why don't you come and join us as a pa and we see how we get on um that that and a, a lot of people nowadays because it's so busy um obviously can't always make that you know they, they may have got a job uh, on another film or they may be seeing somebody else uh but always remember to try and be polite when you're telling somebody oh i can't make that meeting because i'm doing something else because for us to take time out of our day to meet with people is 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 quite something really for anybody if when you're working on a production because there's there, your your mind is so full of of work all the time but i i, I because I fervently, and, 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 and so does Michaela, believe that we have, we, should, we owe it to try and help people. We always try to help people. My tip to people uh, when they're sending emails out, uh, asking to meet people and introducing themselves with their CVs. Now, this is this is not been proven by anybody from in any educational institute, but for me, I tell people not to email folks at weekends. It may have seen the most logical time to email weekends because that they're not they're not nine times that they may not they've got the Sunday off. But when they've got the day a day off, they don't then want to have to be going through emails of everybody's oh dear so and so please could I meet you I've I've read so much about you. So try not to send your emails to people at weekends. And the other thing is never unless you're sending an email to someone that you've met before, someone you know, please never sign off. I look forward to hearing from you because you don't know that person. That person is doing, is doing you a favor by actually even looking at the email. For you saying, I look forward to hearing from you is for me almost arrogant that I've made the effort to send the email and I look forward to getting a reply from you. The fact you've sent the email means you would like a reply um, and, I, and I, I will always reply, but just those little things that, you may you may think oh he's talking nonsense i'll do i'll send it the weekend and i'll sign that and i'll put and you probably will still get interviews with people but for me when i and poor michaela has to put up with it in the office i go, I go oh no another one saying i look forward to hearing from you. Well, they may not hear from me um but invariably they do but uh that's that's another tip really with 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 when you're trying to get contacts um I mean, this this thing here that uh, this little uh, here is something that we're going to address through the course over the next years of uh, next year, next year of the issues of the mind, issues of the body, issues of discrimination, because unfortunately there is still discrimination um, and we've and we've still got to fight that on all levels. That's discrimination against men, against uh, people of different color. Um, but also that comes down to the basic understanding and treating of people and why I would ask everybody who comes into the industry to join the union is that we, although we love making films, it is still a business. And I belong to the Production Guild of Great Britain. I'm still a British Actors Equity member. I'm a member of BEC2 because I fervently believe that we have to have safeguards of how we work. We have to look after this health and safety issues and we have to have rules for everybody. And I know that when you're starting out and, and you're making your, your small film, you have to call upon favours. You may only have five thousand pounds to make the film, so you ask people, you know, oh, can can you do this for next to nothing? Can we borrow a camera here? Totally, that is totally understood. But you can only do that for a certain amount of time. And even on those films, um, there's a couple that I'm I'm going to be involved in coming up now that. We know that we're going to try and do everything to make sure we meet the standard as if we were, were doing a Hollywood movie or a, a studio movie. Um, but the bottom thing here, this is the thing, scripts. Everything is in the script. So I know that you've got to make a living while you're writing your scripts, which is why obviously I encourage people to come and work as PAs or ADs and carry on that side of their careers. But please, please, we need scripts like we've never needed scripts before because we haven't we haven't just got a shortfall of crews we have we've got a shortfall of really really good scripts um and i know that this this was part of jason's remit that's what we were hoping to develop 
that, that through the British Academy and what we're doing, that we're going to try and make a couple of films later this year. We're going to be involved in, in a wonderful film about dyslexia. Um, scripts, scripts are everything. Um, well, well, we'll go over this. I think this is just going over what I've done before. Um, has anybody got any questions at the moment? Just because I have gone on for a, rather a bit here. Is everybody still awake? Hope everybody's still awake. Yes, sorry, we are. Ah, uh, good, good. Oh, Raina, yes, Raina. Just on the point that you said that um, you need scripts, is there any kind of trend going on on what kind of scripts are you looking for, like the industry is looking for? When you say like a good script, is there like genre? Because I've done a research and it's like comedy and drama, but is there anything specific now post um, COVID, for example, that you are looking for? It's, I tell you that the script that is the most popular and everybody will always, is horror stories. Horror okay. scripts. Everybody loves horror scripts. Um, the obviously the studio. You, but I think also scripts. There's the two, two wonderful films out. There's the the Phantom of the Open with Mark Rylance. There's a, the yeah. um, the Duke with Jim Broadbent. And last year um, we did a film called Save the Cinema, which was based on a true story about a, a lady that wanted to save the cinema in Carmarthen and how she saved it. Wonderful scripts human interest scripts we still need human interest scripts um and my, and my my worry and for me the great action movies are the ones that remember that the ones that they're they are human story scripts but they've just got bigger action around it which is why i love no time to die because of the, the, the human element of that that was built within the, the the action and the same with um i don't know how many of you have seen um the war for the planet of the apes yeah absolutely magnificent film and a brilliant script and it comes down to human relationships it comes down to, to the and why i felt the um the, the, the film that i've just seen about elvis while it was very glitzy very showy ultimately it was shallow and i didn't i wanted to know more about colonel tom parker i wanted to know him as a person rather than unfortunately I've, I've, tom hanks is is a great actor but i don't think he was given the material to really develop the character other than a sort of baddie. Um, but I know definitely horror, horror stories. Everybody loves horror stories. My, my genre, I, I love film musicals. And I, so I, I, that, and we haven't really had other than The Greatest Showman, which I thought was superb. Uh, we won't mention Cats. No, we, don't, we shouldn't mention Cats, which is probably the worst film in the last 25 <coughs> years. Um, <laughs> But but also ah now this is a picture of me and Lincoln um, and just that 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 wonderful smile that he's got is is just when when people are like that you you want to run around the world backwards for them to to, to work with them um, and that's why we've got to to address all the issues with us because there a lot of people are bullies still and I mean proper bullies people that go to work each day and pick on a certain member of, of, of the crew or even a certain member of the cast. And, and that shouldn't be tolerated. There are enough talented people and good people that you shouldn't have to put up with people like that. Um, and, and it is being addressed. I, I, I don't think I'm talking uh, out of turn when I say on the Queen Charlotte, which was a spin-off from um, Bridgerton. I think a certain member of uh, the art department was sacked because of the way that he was treating his crew. So I, th I think it, we are moving in, in the right way with that. Um, but, and, but right, if you write back, and then, this is going back to Nick Hextall Smith, a great friend of ours, again, only one arm, um, and uh, never held him back in his career. Um, and, and we've got a lovely girl, I won't mention her name, because I'm not sure, because she had a sight hearing disability, uh, but for her, it wasn't an issue. She was as she's as good as a job as anybody else. There were just occasions where she needed to see our face so that she could understand exactly what we were saying. Um, so the only and we, we never when we interviewed for the interview, we she never we never even she didn't bring that up. And I certainly when we found out when we were in the trailer, uh, all she said was, can, can she sit in a way that she can see our faces all the time to make sure that she was hearing exactly what we were talking about? Um, and that's great that you think that you can go 
um, to an interview and not feel that you've got to, to, to say something that you that to others may be considered a disability, but you've learned to cope with it and learn to deal with it. But on the other hand, I would love it that people can talk about anything like that. Um, it would be your sexuality. What your sexuality is totally uh, down to you and your partner. That that shouldn't make any difference to whether you get a job. Um, so for me, that's that that is one of the. Oh, I've lost myself. Um, the I've never ever had that any kind of discussion with anybody of what their sexuality is or whether that I, they feel that that's affecting their job. That, that may be a discussion for another group on, on, in a different way, but um, I, and with what I've, it, your sexuality should not matter one iota to whether you can do the job or not. Um, oh, no, I'm not, that was Malika. I promise Malika I was, I've mentioned her name now, shut up, you idiot. So language, language now, we're a multicultural industry. You know, I've been lucky to work all around the world. Uh, communication is is the key, um, and if you if you can't quite communicate with each other because either your I mean my English isn't that good, and I've been working with wonderful Italians, uh, Romanians, Hungarians, uh, French. We've got a wonderful French stunt team on this, um, and of course they're all talking to me in English, which is their second language, and they're brilliant at it. Uh, but there are times when there can be um, an issue. I had a lovely um, Serbian assistant director working with me who when he first came here, hadn't learned the nuances of saying please and thank you. So it wasn't that he was deliberately being rude. It was the way that he'd learned English. It was to be direct and, 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 and clear with what he was talking about, but would just not take the edge of it with a please and thank you. So all our time that we've worked together, we've, we've worked on that. And he's, he's a terrific assistant director. Um, but it's it's also having patience with people. If you've- I'm not sure I understand. Oh, that Siri doesn't understand me. Sorry about that. Um, uh, when, especially when you're talking on the radio, do not be scared to say, please repeat that. Because you have to make sure that you understand everything that is being passed on to you. I personally, was taught when I was growing, uh, a very young runner was to repeat the message. So if somebody said, uh, please bring Tom Cruise to set now, I would reply, we need Tom Cruise on set now, over. Um, nowadays, it's copy that. Everybody says copy that. But how do I know that because you've said copy that, you've heard my message correctly in the first place? Um, and then when we had our, our lads join us that were, were ex-soldiers, I said, well, what do they say in the army? And they said, copy that. So that rather took the wind out of my argument. I wanted everybody to repeat what I've said so that I know they've got the message clearly. Um, radio etiquette is, is so difficult, especially if you're on a location where that you keep losing the signal. Um, it's especially vital that the, the young PAs, if you're working as a young PA, all the batteries are always charged up and you're always checking with the first and, and, the, and the, the floor second and the third that they've got a, a fresh battery every two hours because it's that is just a vital part of the job. Um, the um, language have we done, Nick? I'm is working with Nick. I don't. There's. I don't want to get too specific with with um, the working with people who have overcome their disabilities or work with it. I'm hoping we can do that um on a, on a later on in the year uh but i'm going to play a, a a video that richie has put together um who's been working with us on this in the last couple of years i i met richie through uh working with with the uh, heroes um and quite an amazing man and in fact because i have spoken too much i'm just going to play this uh because i think it's what he says is 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 terrific since the age of six, I've always been interested in the cinema. So my uh, uncle and dad took me to the cinema to watch Empire Strikes Back. And, the and, uh, and seeing those images on screen just, just, just hit me. It was like, like, a, like a new world to me. So I was quite interested in, the, in how, how was it done and how was it made and so 
And then for Christmas, I had an annual given to me about the Empire Strikes Back, the making of, and I read it from cover to cover, six years old. And I'm looking at all the photographs and all the pictures of various scenes in the films, the models, the sets, the costumes. It just sparked an interest in, in, in filmmaking for me. And from that point, I was so interested in seeing how films were made uh, that I, it just became an appetite for me. And I was making models of spaceships out of bits of card and paper and bits of plastic bottles and yogurt pots. I'd be looking at a deodorant bottle and I look at that and go, oh, that looks like such and such. And then suddenly disappear and end up in a model somewhere. It gave me something to do because where I lived wasn't a very, very wealthy estate. And uh, my parents were very, very, very good. Uh, couldn't afford very much. And so that gave me a chance to use my imagination, make things, make my own little worlds. And I started looking at different things like making models, paintings, uh, makeup effects. And it just grew from there, really. And I applied for an internship at the BBC, at Acton Studios in London. And they sent me a nice pamphlet saying, well, if you want to apply for a summer, a summer internship, you are welcome to. And for me, that was quite a big thing. So I went to apply for it. And sadly, uh, that year, uh, the BBC decided to close down that studio, um, the special effects. Uh, so I decided to withdraw from college. And at that point, I was lost. Didn't know what to do with myself. I thought, well, this don't work. I can get fit. I always need to I can run around and get fit on that. So I wrote to a stunt man uh, by the name of Tip Tipping, who graciously wrote back to me. And he said uh, his best bit of advice for me was to go and join the army. And in the army, go and become a physical training instructor, get really fit, and then become. Uh, and then gymnastic skills and sports skills and that. And after that three or four years, I could then leave. And then uh, and I wouldn't have to pay for much. He's already been there, that, that, that knowledge and skill set. So, much to the chagrin of my parents, I uh, decided to join the army. So in 1994, I, was, uh, I, went, I went to Bosnia, uh, in the British Army. And, uh, and I saw it happen there, there in Bosnia with, with children and refugees and all horrific things that happened. And my kind of thought about going into special effects and stuff like that snipped behind a little bit and got further and further behind and I stayed in the army for, uh, for 23 years. Uh, the last 10 years of my service, I realised that I need to be prepared to get out. So I decided to study uh, for a degree in music. Uh, right for film and TV, so I did that. Uh, and then I studied further and uh, I, I studied special effects, uh, visual effects, supervising, uh, and then digital uh, painting, digital map painting. Studied all the old map paintings from the past that were used from 1930s onwards. And, and my interest in, in visual effects, special effects, grew from there. Uh, so, the last 10 years, I uh, did various courses around the country, got myself qualified on Steadicam, got myself qualified on camera. And at that point, I became a combat photographer in the British Army. So I used that skill set and learned the fuck of good. And then electronic news gathering course, which was uh, so I could be uh, features for ITV, Sky News, CNN, uh, Reuters. And in that time, it was a privilege to serve but I knew that I was getting quite close to the end of my career and I needed to concentrate on being ready to go into, uh, into civilian street. So I studied harder and harder and harder. I read as many books as I could, City Effects magazine, and just learned the, the trade as much as I could. And I had good stewardship under, uh, for my fear effects, supervisors course, uh, Sheila Duggan of uh, The Hunger Games, Gareth Edwards, who famously went off to do road uh, for Star Wars. Uh, from then, uh, and uh, I just became very adept to that. It was at this point that uh, I got uh, seriously injured in uh, operations overseas. And then later on, I was in Canada, I got injured again in a serious road traffic accident uh, when a, 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 on an exercise, a, a vehicle based IED blew up next to our vehicle. Our driver panicked and drove off the road, uh, leading to be 
me to be thrown 25 foot up in the air, landed on my back on the tailgate of the truck. Uh, I shook it off there and then didn't think much of it. But over four years, I started stumbling, started falling a lot. I had an accident, hurt my thumb, falling down the stairs again. And I went to the doctor and he looked at me and he says, it says something else. And he kept pushing me, kept pushing me. And the next thing I know, I woke up on the floor in the medical centre with nurses around me, doctors rushing around me, trying to find out what was wrong. And I, I had collapsed and I had a full blown nervous breakdown through overwork. And I was uh, put on uh, medical discharge uh, uh, notice for a year, uh, where I went home and kept away from the army for the last year of the service. Um, and, and tried to recover from there. I was at this point where I had a full MRI done on my body and they discovered that the, the falling and stumbling was that my uh, right foot was permanently fractured, which would never heal. Um, I was advised I'll never run again, never swim again, uh, never ride a bike again. Uh, furthermore, they looked at my neck and found that I had a fractured neck and the fracture should have paralysed me at that point. And I slowly lost the ability to walk. And uh, so I had to learn to walk again. Uh, from the basics, just walking in a straight line, using steps and stairs, it wasn't getting any good. So I now have a permanent brace fit to the foot, uh, which keeps my foot upright and it acts like the ligaments in the foot. The, the fracture's still there and it's still painful, but uh, I've gotten used to it now. Uh, my neck, I've gotten used to as well. And, uh, and I've had to rely on uh, resorting to a wheelchair now. How this affects me in the film industry is uh, it's put me back, it really unsettled me because I lost the chance to use Steadicam, lost the chance to use the, the ability to run around, climb, go down steps and stuff, and I was at a loss. Uh, I do digital effects, I can sit in, a, in an office somewhere in Soho and um, push out computer graphics and map paintings and stuff, but it wasn't me, I like the practicality of handling things and building things. I became friends with Terry Bamba for a mutual friend. And uh, during that time, he encouraged me to not give up on, on the industry. And so I pushed a little bit further, worked hard and studied a bit more, studied lighting, studied uh, cameras uh, a bit more. And I just didn't have that edge to get into the industry because I, I, was, I, was, I was disabled. I was, uh, I was, I was struggling with walking, struggling climbing, and would they want some disabled person on set? Because it's quite a fluid environment and you need to be fit. Well, that's what my thoughts were. And then Terry invited me to uh, uh, to help Heroes uh, uh, Cinema get into the industry meeting. And, uh, and he got me in front of the camera, working on front of the camera, acting. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And, about this and the other. Now, as I've done a few independent films, independent filmmakers and budget filmmakers, uh, I didn't consider those to be proper films, even though they are in their own right. Uh, I wanted to do my first big feature. But Terry uh, encouraged me a little bit further. We met again on another function at uh, Catholic, where he had me acting once again in front of the camera and just learning everything. And, uh, and I realised slowly that I knew the stuff in my head, I knew how it all worked and how, how it went, but I just couldn't form my head to put it together. And then one afternoon, uh, Terry rang me up and said, uh, you're at Pinewood Studios on Monday morning, uh, I'll see you there. Uh, you're going to be away for a week. I was like, what am I doing, Terry? Just don't worry about it, I'll see you such and such. At Pinewood Studios. So I turned up at Pinewood Studios and I bumped into an old colleague of mine who was also disabled. And me and him, we stood there going, where are we? What are we doing? And we found that, that Terry had loaded us onto the assistant director's course, and, uh, which is what his job involved is. And we looked at each other and all these guys and thought, what the heck are we doing here? We, we shouldn't really be here. Uh, it's quite too, it's quite too, uh, it's really too difficult for us. It's right above our station, as it were. So in lockdown, he called me up again and my, my colleague, and we went and worked on a film uh, called Unwelcome, which is coming out in October. Fantastic film, it's a horror film. I can't tell you much about it, but uh, it's got some really good characters, you know, really good actors from the UK and there and Ireland. And it's, and it's worth watching. Uh, not only that, Terry had me featured in a, in a couple of pieces on there. 
uh, it wasn't Richie, would you mind going in front of the camera? It was, you will go in front of the camera, you will act. And uh, I thoroughly enjoyed myself. From there on in, we, uh, there was a big interim period of waiting and Terry ended up on Bridgerton. And halfway through Bridgerton, when uh, the scenes were getting bigger and bigger and the stunts were getting more and more dangerous and the crowd scenes were getting bigger, uh, Terry uh, invited me up to do work on Bridgerton for him which was amazing. And then we're currently working on a feature film, which I can't tell you about at the moment because it's, uh, it's secret what we're doing. But there's a, it's a very, very good feature film. And things that I've learned about inclusion on set is that disability does have its problems on set, I won't lie to you. There are some issues like honey wagons, the toilets, they've got steps leading up to them. So if you've got a reduced mobility, you're going to struggle. The studios themselves are, uh, Warner Brothers Studio that we're working at at the moment has started and has put in place accessibility for disabled people, which is brilliant. Disabled toilets dotted around and, and paths that you can use, the zebra crossings and a forced sense of uh, responsibility whilst driving around, which is pretty good. Other studios like Pinewood are yet to catch up with that, I'm going to be honest. Uh, steep curbs, lots of drops, not, not much ready access. However, do what we're doing with Terry and get more disabled people into the industry, this will change. I can see it happening very, very quickly. The things that uh, people with disabilities have, and uh, this includes mental and physical disabilities, is they bring something else to the table. They bring something other people can't see. For some people with Asperger's, their sense of detail is really, really helpful. So for script supervising or continuity, they're the memory skills of, of detail oriented stuff will help in production massively. Uh, other people uh, have an artistic bent where they can produce fine artwork very, very quickly. And that, that kind of talent needs to happen. But some people are very good organisers. Some people are very good communicators. Uh, there's no reason why people with disabilities should be excluded from, from, from film work. There are some problems like bringing uh, animals onto set and people with uh, limited vision on set. But I think once the crew find out there's somebody on set, they're ready to accept them a lot more and make provisions for them and help them a bit more. I had to go down a set of stairs the other day and uh, there's no banister for me to hold on to. And I looked down these stairs and all of a sudden one of the stuntmen jumped out in front of me. He says, put your hands on my shoulders and I'll walk you down the stairs. And that threw me a little bit because I was expecting that. I, was, I, I thought it was going to be on my own. but each day something happens similar to that where I feel included, but like I'm a, a, a part of the system uh, set because of this. I'd rather have the choice of going on set. So if somebody says on this, we've got a really steep surface on here. Can you do it? I have the right to say no. And the, and the attitude is changing. It's very friendly on set. People do make time for you and they do make space for you and they do understand. But if you show willingness and, uh, and enthusiasm that bypasses all the all the, all the uh, things associated with disability and uh, some of the best people I know who act in front of the camera and uh, work behind the camera have got uh, ADHD, Asperger's, PTSD stuff and if you look on the list you find that many many people in the industry that do have mental health problems uh, and there are people in the industry that have physical health problems, but that shouldn't be a barrier to being in the film industry. And it's something I enjoy and it's something I want to carry on forever. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the next film and working on that and working on the next film after that. And the other thing as well is I like to be on set and be treated as an equal. And uh, luckily with Terry's stewardship, I do get that. And it's, I do feel it equal. And uh, none of my negative points about me being slow walking or I have to use a stick sometimes or having to use a wheelchair it doesn't come into play and it's quite good to be included and uh, um, my message is that uh, getting in the industry is very 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 hard uh, but once you're in there you've got to work harder and the only person that's holding you back is yourself don't set your own uh, limits that's um that's richie i've done several things with Richie and Duncan. And, and to add to that, 
uh, Duncan, who who's, I also met through Help the Heroes, uh, when we were doing military wives, I needed um, a military advisor to come and work with us for the day, and and Duncan filled that that role perfectly. There's there's and it's and the thing is, there's so many different roles within the industry now that you can join and 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 be a part of. Um, and I've, I've got one of, one of the lovely people here today is a lovely lad, young lad called Dave Aking, who I met uh, over 11 years ago now in Belfast. And he's got a YouTube channel of marvelous films that he's acted in and he's been part of writing in. And he, he's writing a script at the moment that we're gonna look at and help him with. Um, but it's, it's, the fact is that um, it's, you can have a fantastic career and never work on a Hollywood film. You know, you can, I've, 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 I've got friends and colleagues that have, uh, have set up video companies and they're just video weddings for people. And they've made, they make a great living out of that. Um, it's, you, you don't feel that you have to, you have to work for the, 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 the big studios, the Paramounts, the Warner Brothers and all that. You can have a wonderful career um, and a creative career. Uh, making training films, you know, assisting. Uh, I unfortunately they don't exist anymore now. But I I did a whole year with rank training films, which was uh, working and bringing people into the industry and, and working with other industries and seeing how it all helps. It all ties in. Every industry has needs teamwork, needs team prayers. Every industry has to have a structure of how you 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 plan the day out. Um, and when when in film, I, it's it, it is so important that it, you you take that on board, especially now that uh, we're taking health and safety much more responsibly than we ever did. So every day before you start the day's work or before you start a major setup, you have the, the first AD goes through the, those key things that you've got to work out and invites the HOD who may be in charge of um, special effects or the stunt supervisor, or if there's any wire gags and that it's, it's all about communication. And within that is creating the atmosphere on set that any individual can uh, say something um, if they if they're worried about something or they spot something that they think you may have missed um, to not be as scared to say. It. And I, I tell everybody there is no such thing as a stupid question. Uh, the only stupid question is the one you don't ask. Uh, I remember years and years ago I worked with a wonderful Scottish. Uh, director called John McKenzie, who directed a, a fantastic British film called The Long Good Friday. Again, another brilliant script. And um, uh, what happened there was he asked me to get his chewy. Um, and I'd never heard the expression chewy before, and I thought it was some kind of chewing gum. So I went running off up the hill where we were filming in, in the Yorkshire Dales, looking, looking for his chewy. And, when, and, and, and talking about communication, John Scottish bro could be very threatening and intimidating. Where's my fucking Chewy? And I'm still trying to look at it. And eventually I said, where would I find John's Chewy? And it says, oh, you mean his viewfinder? The, the Chewy was the name of the, the lens viewfinder that he used to set up the shots. But because I was too scared to show that I didn't know what he was talking about, I made an even bigger idiot of myself. So never be afraid. Uh, to ask a question, even if it, you think it's the most obvious question, um, never be afraid of asking that. Um, going back to getting into the industry, I don't know, um, there's so many different ways that you can go, that the courses that you can do now are really, really helpful and they help pave the way because what happens with the courses and the university degrees is that a lot of guest speakers from the industry are invited in to partake in the course. So you're getting an, an, an introduction to someone in the industry almost immediately. And then you can email them and, and progress from there just with um, uh, 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 the cohort of creative media skills this year. A couple of the people were very interested in underwater work um, because I went in to do a couple of days chatting to them. And my contact with Dave Shaw at the underwater stage at Pyro means that one of them has now got a week's work experience there. Um, and, uh, but it's, don't ever, ever think that you're not gonna make it. Um, Cause it just takes one lucky phone call, one being in the right place at the right time. Um, and even for me on, the, on this job at the moment, uh, I'd, I'd been, I was away in America. We were doing a film 
about Brian Epstein. And uh, uh, I got a phone call from the producer on this and asked me, did I, was I interested in be, being the production manager on one of the location shoots for the second unit? Um, I, and I said, oh yeah, I'd, I'd love to do that. Um, went away, was away in America. I thought, well, I haven't heard anything more about that job. Um, and came back to discover that uh, the accountant that was going to be working on that unit had seen my name come up on the unit list and had gone to Universal and the financial controller and said, there is no way that I'm going to work on this film with Terry Bamba. Um, and then it, it explained to them that I'd worked with him on Skyfall and that I had bullied him uh, uh, when we were in uh, Turkey. Well, I certainly have no recollection of, of bullying him, but uh, the, the trouble is with nowadays, you, once, once somebody says that, you don't really get a chance to defend yourself. But on the plus side for me, because I've never really enjoyed production managing, production managing has always been a means to an end. I, I much prefer being on, on the floor and ADing. Um, it came up that the, the, the fight director, the splinter unit director was looking for a first AD. And my name came up to him for, through a mutual colleague um, and we met up and luckily we like he immediately he liked me so i've been working as his assistant director and i've had the time of my life the last few months and that was by accident you know that wasn't by planning that was um by being i guess by being a bully i've got a nice job um so I'm, there are maybe well, other signs. thank you so much for your time terry really insightful and thank you so much for the video as well from richie please give our thanks to, to richie we've got about 10 minutes left Oh, God. Do, do we have any questions for anyone? I've got a few interventions, I suppose you could call them. Yeah. Does anyone have any interventions, comments, questions? You know, like Terry said before, there's no such thing as a stupid question. So you might have some observations, some, some experience that you've had that you want to share with people here. Well, somebody's got a... Right, I'm going to go... To Ellen, 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 I think you had your hand up first. Do you want to come in now? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Mm, something I think that the industry really needs to look at is, uh, I, you know, I always say I've heard this great phrase, privilege is not having to know first. And almost every job I've seen, and it often has it in capital letters, has full clean driving license required. And that's for production, for posts, even for animation. Um, and I have epilepsy, which it's so amazing. It's getting so well managed now, but it's not safe for me to drive. And, you know, we all know the traditional route in is as a runner. And, you know, almost every single position we need to be able to drive. Um, I've made a, an award-winning film for a prestigious arts venue here in Bristol. I have done essay work as well, Terry, which is really interesting. Um, and yeah, super long days. Um, but I think that's just such a problem for the industry that you wouldn't know about if you weren't in my position. Um, I've called some people about it, and they've just been given me a brush off, basically. Um, and yeah, I think it's something people need to look at. Um, it's so annoying as well, because I mean, as we've prepared, um, often people who have obstacles to overcome, that's who you really want to work with, because they're going to be the most motivated in the world. Oh, well, but, but please, can, can you email me after this? And we have, you know, because obviously a, a lot of our youngsters that come in haven't got driving license and there had and you're quite there should be a provision for it and i think um with the the fact now that we're getting so many new studios and you know and on both sides mm. of London, and not just west london east london i think that that that, that ability to get around as, and also especially with the climate change and trying to get people off the road with well cars. that's very true you know, um, so, you know i have an e-bike which is from local, you know, it looks like a moped. I got pulled over by the police. It's so incredible. Um, but the other thing is that because of my epilepsy, I'm still, you know, finding the right medication, which can take a long time. Um, I am in Bristol, and 
I'm not really ready to move further because also I have to make sure that I can keep myself safe. Mm. And you know, everyone talks about oh, we've got these great inclusions, schemes, and everything. But so many of them, if you're over 25, you're just completely, you know, you don't tick the box. And I haven't been working before that age because my epilepsy was undiagnosed. Mm. So it just seems if you just don't tick the box, then a bit like you said, Terry, with looking forward to your reply, all the jobs say we don't discriminate against blah, blah, blah in the small print. And I think, well, I should hope you don't. Yeah. It's a bit like saying frozen ice cream. You know, surely that's inherent. You know, it's just a complete nonsense get out clause. And you know, I had an interview with Ardman Animations, which is great. Um, I think I got the interview by drawing a picture of Wallace on my TV, doing cutting TV, right? Um, which is great. But, uh, but it's such a problem in the industry, and it's something, yeah, that nobody's seeing. Um, it's really upset that even Post was out of the picture. So, um, yeah, I think I wrote an article about it online and even speaking to, oh, who did I speak to in Bristol? It might have been Evolution or somebody else. And again, they all just kind of gave me the brush off. They have great intentions, but it's, it's something people really need to look at. And, but, yeah, my friend says, you know, oh, there's great opportunities in London. Yeah, and of course there are. But, you know, I'm still working with my neurologist on finding the best medication. It's going incredibly. Um, but it does feel like, well, what else can I do? I mean, I made an award winning film, got it screened in front of somebody from the BBC. It's terrifying to screen a comedy, but luckily people did laugh. Um, so, you know, it's a fun essay. You know, what else can you do? It's just keeping you locked out without people realizing it. But well, um, I said my piece. So shall no, I? no, that, but please, please email me because. I've got a great colleague who's, who's, who's doing a lot of television work based in, in Bristol. I mean, mm. I, and I, maybe I can introduce you to him and something can come from that because he's, he's a wonderful producer. Um, and I've oh, that would be many. great. So I, I'm not sure if I've got, if you've got my email address from it. It's Terry. Um, well, I could get it from Rainer. Yeah, please, um, but please, please email me. Um, and and the and he's a, 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 I've got some wonderful contacts in Bristol, and let, let's let's definitely stay in touch, please. Thanks, uh, thanks. Oh, that would be lovely, Terry. Thanks for that, Helen. I think Jeffrey's next, and then Nathan. I uh, arranged oh. just put Terry's email up in the chat. Oh. Thanks, well, thanks yes. so much for the for the for the um, talk. It's been really interesting. A couple of things you mentioned at the beginning about eight hour days once upon a time, or you've managed to achieve that somehow. That is it's absolutely insane. I'm, I mean, I don't work, uh, work mostly in Indy, so I do 12, well, 11 hour plus one, and then two hours traveling per side, mostly, uh, for a lot of for things. So that is insane. That would be amazing for us, the industry, to go back to a 10 hour day. Like, I would be all for that. Um, and uh, that would be fantastic. And I'm really glad you said that people are looking for good scripts, because that is something that you don't really hear bantered around. So... I'm hoping that we can all, well, all of us work on this program and all work on some scripts and, and all move forward in that direction. Um, so, um, and certainly Helen just mentioned about the driving. I definitely second that point. Uh, I also can't drive mm. uh, for medical reasons. And I think that, uh, yeah, that's a really, really point. I've definitely lost out on a lot of jobs because of that. Um, one that I even kind of got handed to once saying, oh, yes, we, we, when can you start? Oh, but you can't drive, you know. So um, that, that's a great point that I would, I would love to be, you know, if, if you get to mention that to anybody, uh, uh, you know, or at some point in the industry, like, well, that would be a great change if we could change that. Um, the most yeah, definitely, so most definitely. And, and not just in helping people, but in, in helping the, the world. You know, we have got to address the fact that sometimes on a big shoot, you've got 500 cars turning up. Uh, you know, oh, okay. and that's, it's and you. We have got to look at different ways of doing that. But in fact, with the recce we did yesterday, because we're going to film, it, we've got a couple of sequences in the centre of London. We we want to put on a minibus because there's no parking there, 
and you've got the congestion charge. So even on that, not on a, a sort of a, a personal level, just on a financial and, and practical level, we've got to address it. And I'm really pleased you both said that because that is something that, um, I mean, we are lucky that we, when we're filming in London, obviously people can get public transport and we, and we arrange, we do split calls for our runners. If, if they can't get in till say 8.30, then we'll get another runner who can get in. So we definitely should address that more. Definitely. I'm glad that that's been brought up. Oh. Yeah, well, great. I'm glad you, yeah, that, that's been, that's good to hear. Anyway, thank you very much for the talk and I'll let move no. on to Paul Nathan there who's waiting. Um, but thank you so much. Um, and hopefully we well, will. Hopefully we'll, be all, another we'll, workshop yeah, we'll all get there. to work. We'll all get to work. Together. Yeah, that would be amazing. Yeah, thank you. Hey, yeah. Thanks a lot, Jeffrey. You've got Nathan next and then Rob. Thanks. Hi, Terry. Um, my questions, I'm going to try and make it as quick as I can. I've just come off the film set as a floor PA, started on work experience. Um, that's up here in the Peak District. There's not much that gets filmed up here. So I think something which has definitely been suggested and something which I need to commit to is to move to London and try and get some studio work or some on-set kind of work there. So obviously you've got your networking, WhatsApp, that kind of thing. I wondered if there's any out of the box advice that you can give for anyone who's trying to go on to this the second set or to make that move it'll be technically their first studio work kind of thing it's 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 difficult because i don't i think it's always better you you stay based where where your home is and where you want where you want to live and i uh, not but where and and in fact a lot of the people working with me recently them the the pay they received has, has gone into paying for their hotels uh, which is sad. And I, and I think that's what well, I think Pinewood may be developing. Other studios I know, like when I was in, um, in Malaysia, uh, when they developed the Pinewood Studios in Johor Bahru, which is near the border with Singapore, they actually, part of that was a hotel built around the grounds so that the crew could stay there um, at a very a greatly reduced uh, rate because, uh, it, because most, of the, most of the crew would have come from Kuala Lumpur and that meant that they would have to be staying on location. Um, it's the difficult thing is when you want to be on a base in the studios, of course, the studio don't see that they're on location, so they don't want to pay travel allowances. They don't want to pay any per diems or, or pay for overnights. So it, it's trying to find a way of, of finding somewhere cheap to stay. Um, that, that means that you can accept the job and still get a living wage. Um, I, when we're at Pinewood, there's a wonderful, it's, um, it's the nunnery that they, 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 they offer wonderful rooms, but of course, I think they've only got about 20 rooms. Um, and when it's very busy, um, I, when I've been away, um, I filmed up in real in North Wales a couple of years ago. Um, and I stayed, I found a premier inn or a travel lodge. Now, luckily, obviously my wage is a bit more than a PA's. So I could afford to pay that and still have a decent money. So that is something that uh, is very worth looking into. Because uh, I don't think that you should have to give up your home. But I know people do. My, Michaela, my second, uh, is Italian. Um, and to further her career, that she she was advised or knew that she would have to come to London to try and get base. And now she, she had to rent places. And it's so, so expensive, friends, in places now. Um, but if you... If you if you wanted to come and find studio work, because there are so many studios going up in and around London, um, and I, I'm unfortunately I'm a little bit ignorant of what there is. I mean, I've worked in Leeds. There was a couple of studios in Leeds I filmed out. Uh, I've done some uh, location work in Liverpool and at Manchester, um, but I guess most of my work has been down here. But that's a good point you make about. If you say you or you're born in Cornwall or somewhere and somebody says, well, if you really want to make, you've got to get into where you can get to work early in the morning. Um, I tell, Can you email me that? And I could that's that, that's yeah. something I need to give more thought to. But I think that's definitely something that does need more thought and, and see if we can come up with practical solutions to that without people having to pay a fortune just to try and come in to get down into a studio base. Yeah, that would be that would be my pleasure. I'll uh, I'll send you an email. I'm actually at work, so I'm going to have to sign off now. But thank you so much for your time and thank you. No, for thank you. Thanks so, thanks so please, please email me. I will. Thank you, Terry. Thanks, Nathan. Keep yeah. in touch. I think we've got Rob next, and then Anna. So, Rob, I think you've got a question or a comment. Are you still there, Rob? Yes, I'm here. Yes, it's actually um, my son is uh, Dave who uh, Terry very kindly mentioned earlier there, just like to 
say a couple of words. Yes, I just want to say how great this talk was, Terry, and how inspirational you are to me and so many other people. Well, that's very kind of you. But you're listen, but you're more inspirational to me. I haven't made any films on YouTube. You've made about 40 odd films on YouTube. So you're 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 the inspiration I'm holding up to everybody that we can all make films, we can all be part of it, and it's and we are all inclusive. So I thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Well, I, I, I'd, I'd personally rather be making films that will be in the cinema as opposed to just somebody's computer on YouTube. I want to aim higher. You keep that. We'll get, we'll get there, Dave. I promise you, we'll get there. That's great. I just want to ask a quick question, and it might be a silly question, but I'll try and word it properly i don't drive so if i ever do get into the film industry and i get a phone call saying you have to be here at this said time i know taking a taxi would be the obvious answer but what, what advice would you give to people who don't drive but this industry does require a lot of traveling and moving about well, funny as you said it, because we've just had that question previously as well, which I'm really pleased people have brought it up because it is something we've got to address. Um, the thing is, Dave, if we were on a film um, and we were filming um, in uh, France or we were filming in Italy or somewhere, then the company would provide transport for us. They would they would fly us out to the location and there'd be a mini bus that would pick us up from the hotel and take us. So I've with these questions, I think it's something that I want to address within the studio system that they're, they're used as a bus. If you can get the underground um, to Uxbridge, there is a, a, a shuttle service between the studios and so at, and Pinewood Studios and Uxbridge Underground. So there are ways you don't uh, you don't have to worry that you can't drive. We, we will we will make ways to make sure you can get to work without having to drive. OK, OK. Thank you very much. Anyway, see you very soon. I'm coming to Belfast again soon. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. I look Thanks. forward to that. Cheers. All the best. Thanks Thank a lot. Anna, Anna, you've got a question or a comment? Yeah, first off, I would just like to say it was an amazing, amazing talk. It's very inspirational, especially for very, very young filmmakers who are just starting off in the industry. It was really inspirational. And I had a question. If you have any advice for young filmmakers, especially script writers who really want to start off, but they don't know what to do with their scripts or how to improve. Do you have any advice? It's the, uh, the, the, the best thing is to try and get a, a, somebody who's a script writer themselves. But I've been involved uh, with, there's a wonderful organisation at Pinewood Studios called Liftoff, who, uh, who accept scripts from people. And then they, the, the, the scripts that they like, they may go on to get made. And in fact, later this year, um, uh, there's a, a script festival down in Southampton and uh, we chose two scripts as winners and they're going to be made. So I think you should look for all sorts of competitions where you can send your script off uh, and get people to read it. That's the main thing. Um, I get lots of scripts sent to me that obviously, I, I must be honest, I don't always get the chance to read straight away because of work. Uh, but I always try to advise them. I'll try and I'll get those. In fact, that's a good, I should get a list of the places where you can send your scripts to, where you, if, they, if it, unfortunately, it always comes down to competition. And I don't always believe in competition because uh, some of the best scripts in the world have been turned down by studios because that particular person didn't like that story. Um, but I, have you got final draft? Do you, do you write your scripts in final draft? Uh, I only just finished college. I'm only 19, oh, yeah. but oh, and I'd sorry. like to be a director. Yeah. Uh -huh. But because I lack experience, I think I'm sort of becoming a, a script writer out of necessity because I really want experience directing, so I need to write my own things. Um, but, yeah, I know a few people who would really, really like to get more into script writing, or my, myself included. So, Well, this, 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 what we, we must try. Where, where are you based? Um, I live in Derbyshire, same as um, uh, Nathan, who just left. Well, listen, yeah. please please email me because 
probably we're, we're going to run out of time here, but Michaela, who, who works with me, she the next little film we're doing, she's directing a script that the, the script that won the prize down in Southampton. She's going to direct it. Um, and she's during COVID, she actually wrote and, and directed a little film for herself, which went on YouTube. And we're, we'll look to see what other avenues there might be for you to pursue. So please email us and we'll, and we'll get back to you with some ideas. I will. Thank you very much. Yeah. And good luck to you. Good luck to you. Thank you. It's... Many thanks for that, Anna. So unfortunately, we've run out of time. But if you can all stay on, as I said at the beginning, if it's OK with everybody, if you can all turn your camera on, because I think it'd be good if we could take a screenshot of everybody. There's 21 people now in the yeah. meeting and that would be great. So I don't know if we have to yeah, that's turn fine. I'm your take presentation them. off or is that okay, Raina? Yeah, that's fine. Don't worry. Just if anybody, everybody wants to turn their cameras, I'm just gonna screenshot and I'm gonna make a collage of the whole thing, okay? That would be great. So if you can turn your camera on, that would be yeah. brilliant. I've, I've got on here Terry, Anna, and Rob and Dave. I don't know if everybody else can do that as well. I think Terry needs to turn his presentation off and then we can put oh, it on right. like gallery mode within the meeting. That would be cool. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot. That's okay. Mm -hmm. What have you got there now, Raina? What can you see? Um, I'm on the screen where I have Anna Marie, uh, Quality, George, and EK is with the camera off. Okay, if people don't mind, if people can turn their camera on, that would be cool. So I put that in the chat as well. Maybe some people can't hear me. Yeah. Let me just see. Some very fine looking people there. <laughs> How many people we got there now? Can you see? I think that's fine, yeah. That's cool. So you can do that now. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Brilliant. That's all good now, yeah. Good. So you got that. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Raina. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, so we have to say thanks again to Terry. That's been a brilliant talk, really inspirational. Just a couple more final points. I'm interested in people, if they are interested in writing a blog for us, for mm -hmm. Evolution Film as part of this project, that would be great. If you go on to my website, which is cjplee.com, you'll be able to see previous blogs they've been read in 34 countries so you can get international impact from your blog so a blog as you know is just 300 words possibly it doesn't take too much time be really interested in anyone who wants to write a blog if you can just email me that would be great and also this comes back to Anna's point we're developing a mentoring system as part of this project and we're already linking up particular people to mentors so if you're interested in that from any perspective as a mentor or as a mentee do, de do get in touch with Raina, Terry and myself that would be that would be brilliant and just finally we're there is a series of events as part of this organization evolution film and the next one is in September so Raina will be in touch about that there's Raina's email. Thanks a lot, Raina. And the next event is hopefully with the head of 104 Films. 104 Films is the disability film production company within the UK. So this will be from the perspective of the CEO of that. So, so that's brilliant. I don't know, Raina, have you, have you got any more points you want to add here before we yeah. <laughs> Just a moment. Let me turn my camera on. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to, to really say thank you so much for everyone who have participated today. And thank you, Terry, for this amazing presentation and so many good points on there. 
It is such a pleasure to actually see, now we have been working on this project for a few months, to see that, you know, we are matching people are coming to us and, and whatever we can do to help. So we can work on that destigmatizing the mental health and disability as it currently stays in our society and actually include everyone because everyone matters and everyone counts. So it's just such a pleasure to see this happening. And I'm really, really grateful to see you all here and we really appreciate you all. So do get in touch if you have any questions. As Jason said, we have our next workshop on the 14th of September. And our guest speaker is Justin Edgar from 104 Films. Uh, and then we have another event in December the 14th as well, which then is gonna culminating in the uh, conference that is still to be considered when we're gonna do it, okay? And we've got our films to make. Yeah. Yes, that exactly. is right. And there's, lots, there's lots to get involved in. Do stay mm -hmm. in touch. And yeah, we hope we hope you've really enjoyed the day. I have. Thanks a lot, Terry. It'd be great if Rainer and Terry, if you could stay on for a few minutes, that would be great. And also, Rainer's doing an event soon. So do keep a lookout for our website that's being developed, evolutionfilm.org, because the recording of that event will be on that website. So that will be really interesting. That will be all about disability and film. And there'll be people from behind the camera, who people work in front of the camera, actors and so on, at this major international event coming up. So that would be great. So yeah, thanks a lot, everybody, for your questions. And yeah. And, and please, thank please, you very much, please, Terry. Yeah, please email anything, any question or anything you want to, to talk about, please email me and I'll get Michaela onto the case straight away. It's... Brilliant. And Richard, I need to see you in my office soon. <laughs> yes, Matt, it's evolution.org. It's not running yet. It's still in development, but as yeah. soon as we roll it out, we will, we will let you know, guys. And also- You are on, on mute, you are on mute, Matt. Thank you. I right. just wonder, I, I'd love, I mean, if anybody's interested, I'd love to share, share this PowerPoint with everyone because it's got Richie's interview on it. Exactly. And, it's got, and it's got a 45 minute little interview I did at LA in BAFTA about my dad's career. My dad talks cool. on it as well. So I'd, I'd love to share that with people as well. I wanted to put the Skyfall extracts on it, but of course, you're not allowed to share anything owned by Eon. So we couldn't use that today. That, that would be great. That'd be great. If we can put that on the, on the website. Yeah. That would yeah. be brilliant, and people can access that. That would be really perfect. Well, listen, have, have a great weekend, everybody. I'm, I'm off to see Thor this afternoon. Oh, brilliant. That's got, that's got good reviews. It looks funny. Great. Hey, thanks, thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks, thanks, thanks Terry thanks. Bamber. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very Thank you. Brilliant. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Cheers. Keep in touch, everybody. Bye. Bye. Matt, Bye. Uh, Matt was asking something here about the Facebook group. I don't know whether he's still there. We don't have a Facebook group yet. We are considering socials. We'll just have to be patient with us, but we will let you know. Brilliant. All right. Thank you. No worries. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs> Is Terry still here? Is he gone? Yeah, I'm still here. I'm still here. Okay. Okay. Where is the... I think. All right. Um, oh, yeah. There we I are. I can't see people. Can you stop recording? Who is recording? Oh, is that Terry, me? Am I recording? There is recording, I think. Yeah. Do I end? Yeah. What's that? End? No, I don't want to end the meeting, do I? Oh, stop video. Stop recording at the top, I think. Oh, oh yes. Yeah.